Here is a diesel-powered HMS Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier. And here is a nuclear-powered USS Gerald Ford aircraft carrier. You may think that being nuclear-powered, Ford-class carriers would be a clear winner, as they have virtually unlimited range, while HMS Queen Elizabeth carriers have a range of only 10,000 nautical miles before it needs to be refueled. But even if we discount the food supplies needed for both types of vessels, USS Gerald Ford would still need to be refueled from time to time with fuel for the aircrafts that it carries on board. After all, it can only hold so much aircraft fuel. While unlimited range may seem like an advantage at first, saving money on fuel and resupply runs, the more you look into it, the more you realize that it takes a while, if ever, for the benefits to pay off. Think of a hybrid car. You pay more money for it up front to enjoy the fuel savings in the long run, but it will take years before it breaks even. So let's take a look at all the advantages and disadvantages of nuclear versus diesel-powered aircraft carriers and try to come to a conclusion. Which one is the better value for money? As in the end, it's all about the cost, or is it really? Ford-class nuclear carriers are powered by two A1B nuclear reactors, which provide 25% more power than its predecessor A4W nuclear reactors that are used on Nimitz-class carriers. It is estimated that each A1B reactor produces 125 megawatts of electricity. That's enough to power 25,000 homes. Additionally, each A1B reactor produces 350,000 shaft horsepower, which is equivalent to 260 megawatts. Increased electricity production compared to older reactors means that electromagnetic aircraft launch systems can be used which accelerate aircrafts more smoothly and thus puts less stress on their airframes. In contrast, HMS Queen Elizabeth carriers are powered by two 36 megawatt gas turbine alternators located underneath each island, which by the way is the main reason for the twin island design due to the engine exhaust shafts. There are also four 10 megawatt diesel engines in the middle of the ship. In total, the ship's power plant produces 112 megawatts of electricity, half of which powers multiple electrical motors that spin the propeller shafts. You might be surprised to find out that conventional diesel burning power plants are more efficient than nuclear power plants. When you burn diesel, 40% of the fuel is turned into useful energy. While in a nuclear power plant, 33% of the fuel is turned into useful energy. This is because conventional power plants can generate steam at a higher temperature, therefore providing more force to the turbines. But efficiency is not that important when it comes to nuclear power plants, as nuclear fuel is much more energy dense. If you were to run each type of aircraft carrier with 200,000 horsepower non-stop for one week, a conventional carrier would require over 5 million liters of diesel fuel, while a nuclear carrier would require just 4 kilograms, 4 kilograms of enriched uranium. In other words, a nuclear carrier consumes as little as 0.00008% of the fuel that conventional carriers do. Let that sink for a second. We did too. So while on paper, nuclear propulsion is less efficient, it still provides much more power in total due to the higher energy density of nuclear fuel. In fact, Ford-class carriers have about seven times the power available compared to HMS Queen Elizabeth-class carriers. But to be fair, the Ford-class carrier is about 67% larger than its counterpart. This energy supply is needed for new power-intensive weapon systems like railguns as well as new generation powerful radars. Having more power also means that nuclear-powered carriers can travel faster. In fact, Ford-class carriers can travel 5 knots faster than HMS Queen Elizabeth ships. The faster the ship travels, the more apparent wind it generates, meaning it is easier for aircrafts to take off. However, in case of Queen Elizabeth carriers, wind is not a factor as these ships don't have catapults and they rely on F-35B aircrafts, which use short takeoff and vertical landing technology. Now to the crazy part, range, fuel tanks, and bills. HMS Queen Elizabeth weighs 65,000 tons and holds 1 million gallons of F-76 marine diesel for the ship and 750,000 gallons of F-44, also known as JP-5 jet fuel, for the embarked aircrafts. 
To put this in perspective, the total amount of fuel on a Queen Elizabeth carrier is equivalent to 120 fuel trucks, or you fueling your car 127,000 times. In 2020, the average cost for both types of fuel was roughly 3 US dollars, meaning that it would cost $3 million to fuel up the carrier and $2.2 million to fill up the planes. A full tank of fuel allows a carrier to travel 10,000 nautical miles at most, which is roughly equal to a trip from Portsmouth to Rio de Janeiro and back. During operations, aircraft carriers, whether nuclear-powered or diesel-powered, will consume a lot of aviation fuel, meaning that both type of carriers will need to undergo replenishment at sea at frequent intervals. Moreover, aircraft carriers almost always travel with escort ships, which are diesel-powered, meaning that there is always a need for fuel tankers. The Royal Navy's Tide class tanker can replenish Queen Elizabeth class ships simultaneously with jet fuel and marine diesel through the rigs on the carrier's port side. Logistically speaking, it is still harder and slower to refuel a conventionally powered aircraft carrier compared to a nuclear one, as you have to do more frequent replenishments. Nuclear reactors on carriers have to be refueled only every 20 to 25 years or so. For instance, USS Theodore Roosevelt underwent refueling and complex overhaul after 23 years of service. However, it did take four years to complete and cost $2.6 billion. As mentioned earlier, nuclear fuel has much higher power density, meaning it takes less space to store a given amount of energy. This means that nuclear-powered Ford and Nimitz-class ships have much more free storage capacity, so they can store more jet fuel, weapons, and so on. In fact, on average, nuclear carriers carry twice as much jet fuel compared to their counterparts. The bottom line is that nuclear carriers make a lot of sense if you're covering a large geographical area, especially something like the Pacific Ocean. Another benefit of nuclear propulsion is that it provides plenty of steam for the catapults that are used on Nimitz-class carriers. The newer Ford-class carriers, however, rely on electromagnetic aircraft launch systems that don't require steam, but use a considerable amount of electricity. While Queen Elizabeth-class carriers don't currently have any sort of catapults, they may be retrofitted with electromagnetic catapults one day, and the good thing is that they have sufficient spare electricity generation available for it. The next element worth exploring is construction time. Some say it takes much longer to build a nuclear carrier compared to a conventional one. For instance, it took 13 years to build the French nuclear-powered Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier, but only 8 years to build the HMS Queen Elizabeth. However, it took 13 years to build a conventional-powered Russian carrier, Admiral Kiznetsov, and only 8 years to finish nuclear-powered carrier USS Gerald Ford. If you look at the Nimitz-class carriers, it took between 4 to 7 years to build each of the 10 ships. Having a large nuclear industry, talent and expertise certainly plays a role in how fast one can build a carrier of any type. If you look at the Chinese, they bought an old Soviet-built Kuznetsov-class aircraft carrier, but it took them 14 years to rebuild it and make it combat ready. At the same time, it took the Chinese only 4 years to build a Type 2 conventionally powered carrier from scratch. Italian diesel-powered aircraft carrier Cavour was built in 7 years. So just by looking at the build time of the recent aircraft carriers, it's hard to say which one can be built faster. The real benchmark would be the Americans building a conventional carrier. Aircraft carriers are expensive to begin with, but nuclear-powered carriers not only carry a higher initial price tag, but their operation and maintenance costs are also much higher than diesel-powered ones. The fuel bill for Queen Elizabeth-class carriers and also the replenishment at sea costs will certainly add up over time, but it would still be much lower than if the ships were nuclear-powered. Having a nuclear reactor on a ship is complicated. Traditional land reactors rely on gravity to drop control rods to shut down a reactor. But that would be impossible on a moving ship that can go up and down in waves. The solution is to use a mechanical system to insert rods into the reactor's core, which adds to the cost. Additionally, a desalination plant specifically for the reactor must be built and maintained in order to provide fresh water for reactor cooling. Some say that nuclear-powered carriers are greener as they don't produce any CO2, but they do produce nuclear waste, and the disposal of nuclear waste is also a big challenge. 
USS Enterprise was deactivated in 2012 and it took four years just to defuel eight of its reactors. Since 2018, USS Enterprise is stored in Hampton Roads until disposal plans can be determined by the US Navy. So in terms of disposing, nuclear-powered carriers are clearly at a disadvantage when compared to diesel-powered vessels. Another thing to consider is nuclear safety. Due to changes in nuclear safety standards, the French Charles de Gaulle carrier had to add extra protection all around the reactor as the detectable radiation leakage was above the revised standards. For the US Navy, the argument can be made that nuclear power is safe. For instance, the US Navy operates 103 nuclear reactors on 81 ships. For more than half a century, there has been no accidents or radioactive releases as the Navy operated almost 6,000 reactor years. However, the same cannot be said about the early days of Soviet nuclear program, which suffered multiple reactor meltdowns as well as countless radiation leaks. Some notable Soviet nuclear accidents include K-19 submarine accident at sea, where a reactor cooling system failure resulted in nine deaths from acute radiation syndrome. Same thing happened on K-27 and nine people lost their lives due to radiation. Finally, in 1985, K-431 was being refueled when criticality occurred, which resulted in an explosion killing 10 workers and releasing over 200 petabacorels of fission products into the atmosphere. Whenever a nation decides to build an aircraft carrier, there are two more things in play, politics and prestige. In 2019, Pentagon decided to cut aircraft fleet from 11 to 10 and retire USS Truman early instead of undergoing midlife refit, a move that would save more than $30 billion over 25 years as the cost of refueling the carrier was pegged at $3.4 billion and additional billion dollars would be saved each year by not operating the carrier and its air wing. Congress was outraged by such a proposal, and soon thereafter, President Trump ordered the U.S. Navy to keep USS Truman. American supercarriers are unique icons of military power that project dominance in the international waters. No matter the cost, they are not going anywhere anytime soon. In fact, U.S. Navy is currently in the process of replacing all 10 Nimitz-class carriers. So far, two Ford-class carriers have been completed, with one currently under construction, and seven more planned. Going back to answering the original question, which type of carrier is better value for money? We have to say, it depends. In case of Queen Elizabeth-class carriers, conventional power makes sense as the Royal Navy has limited budget and both carriers are mostly deployed in the Northern Atlantic, making the travel range less of an issue. With regards to the US Navy, nuclear makes sense as the distances that its carriers cover are much larger, especially in the Pacific region. And it's definitely about the prestige as well. Having 11 nuclear carriers in its fleet, the United States projects its dominance in the international waters. With regards to which technology is cheaper over the long term, it is hard to say for two reasons. First of all, when comparing nuclear-powered versus conventionally-powered carriers, it is not exactly an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, as the ships are of different sizes. For instance, Ford-class carriers are 67% larger than Queen Elizabeth-class carriers. There are simply no conventionally-powered carriers with displacement of 100,000 tons, so it's hard to say what the lifetime cost of running that kind of a ship would be. Secondly, no nuclear-powered aircraft carrier has been fully disposed of as of yet. But one thing is clear, it would be pricey. What do you think? Which type of carrier is better value for money? And does it even matter? In today's world, aircraft carriers are the ultimate icon of military dominance. And if you want that kind of military power, the cost is probably not much of an issue. If you watched this far, we hope you enjoyed this video. And if so, hit that like button. It matters to us.